You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. Yeah, th- this law is probably one of the most important consumer protection laws in place, but unfortunately, most consumers do not know that it exists. And really, it's looking like some financial t- institutions don't know that it exists either. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Caveat, the CyberWire's privacy surveillance law and policy podcast. I'm Dave Bittner, and joining me is my co-host, Ben Yellen, from the University of Maryland Center for Health and Homeland Security. Hello, Ben. Hello, Dave. On this week's show, Ben looks at an appeals court case on peer-to-peer file sharing and the Fourth Amendment. I'll be discussing the FBI's recent testimony before a Senate Judiciary Committee on whether or not to ban ransomware payments. And later in the show, my conversation with David Derajotis of Burns & Wilcox. We're going to be discussing protections related to fraud that are provided by the Electronic Fund Transfer Act. While this show covers legal topics and Ben is a lawyer, the views expressed do not constitute legal advice. For official legal advice on any of the topics we cover, please contact your attorney. And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud, the cybercrime analytics leader. SpyCloud disrupts cybercrime by telling you what criminals know about your business and your customers, so you can take action to prevent ransomware, session hijacking, account takeover, and online fraud. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, including credentials, session cookies, and PII siphoned from malware-infected devices. With knowledge of the specific exposed data criminals have in hand from InfoStealer malware on managed and unmanaged devices, security teams can respond with a more efficient and effective process called post-infection remediation that fits seamlessly into existing incident response frameworks. Get SpyCloud's post-infection remediation guide outlining the seven steps for preventing a malware infection from becoming a full-blown ransomware incident. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. This episode is brought to you by Palo Alto Networks, the leader in cybersecurity. As AI-driven attacks increase, organizations can't afford to have network security that's stuck in the past. Discover how Palo Alto Networks can help you predict what's coming and proactively secure against it with a zero-trust, AI-powered network security platform built to secure whatever, whenever, wherever. To learn more, visit paloaltonetworks.com slash network security platform. All right, Ben, uh, let's just jump into our stories here this week. Why don't you start things off for us? So I found a story, again, from my favorite uh, member of Appeals Court Twitter, which is a real thing. Uh, Gabriel (laughs) Maller, another person who we're going to have to send a gift basket uh, on Christmas (laughs) because he keeps alerting me to interesting cases. All right. This comes from uh, the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, U.S. Court of Appeals. This is a federal case. The incident happened in the state of Minnesota. Hmm. So a law enforcement officer... Uh, downloaded part of a computer file containing child pornography. Uh, He downloaded that file on a peer-to-peer network from an IP address connected to an individual named Christopher Shipton. Okay. Shipton, um, based on that suspicion, they they raided his house, uh, found more digital devices with child pornography. He was arrested and prosecuted. Hmm. He is challenging uh, his arrest and prosecution on Fourth Amendment grounds, saying he has a reasonable expectation of privacy in uh, sharing data on a peer-to-peer network. Hmm. So what happened here is this Minneapolis police officer had a suspicion about Mr. Shipton and other individuals, um, had a suspicion that they were sharing child pornography on peer-to-peer networks. Uh, So they use this program called Roundup Emule, which neither of us have heard of. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Although I will say, I I certainly, in my younger days, I spent a good amount of time on peer-to-peer networks. Uh, Oh, didn't we all? Yeah. (laughs) Right, exactly. Before before music subscription uh, services were a thing, I may have, uh, you know, downloaded a a copy of one of my favorite albums or something like that. So, you know, most of us have... 
have done our time on peer-to-peer networks and are familiar with what they are. I will uh, not confirm nor deny that I still have music in my library from LimeWire, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> right, I will save right. that for another time. There you go. Uh, so what they do is they, the officer uses what's called the file's hash value, mm. um, and using that hash value, they're able to con- obtain the complete file match it against known files that contain child pornography and make the connection that this person is trafficking uh, child pornography. Hmm. Because it's all part of a child protection system database, uh, which, as a uh, lower court judge explained, compiles these hash values of previously identified child pornography files and documents. Hmm. So without actually seeing the file, somehow they have a view into the peer-to-peer network and they can sort of, uh, I don't know, these files have a fingerprint based on their hashes, and that's how they go after them. Absolutely. And now they have several programs. One of them is this Roundup eMule, but there are others, G2 Scanner, Nordic Mule, um, that are tools that law enforcement use to help identify and find these files. Uh, What Shipton, the defendant, is arguing is that the officer who used this program performed a search under the Fourth Amendment and should have required a warrant. Hmm. What the court uh, said and the conclusion they came to is that Mr. Shipton does not have a reasonable expectation of privacy in information that is shared over a peer-to-peer network. Uh, And this is based on longstanding precedent in the Eighth Circuit and in other courts across the country that if you are engaging in file sharing, you are necessarily doing something that's public. You're not trying to conceal that file, it's not something that you're keeping in a private place. Right. It's something that you're sharing publicly. And so right. it would make sense that you <laughs> right. don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in that huh. information. Interesting. So what Shipton tried to argue in front of this court is that there are three recent Supreme Court uh, cases that would justify a newfound legal doctrine saying that uh, peer-to-peer file sharing merits Fourth Amendment protection. And the court rejected his argument, but I'll, I'll briefly bring up those three cases that that he uh, invoked. Hmm. The first is Carpenter v. United States, which we've talked about a million times, yep. Yep. Uh, where the court said that you need a warrant to obtain historical cell site location information. What the court said is, yes, that information is something that you've shared publicly, And, you know, so maybe there's a parallel there, but that's very detailed personal information about your long-term historical movements. That's very different than what files you share on a peer-to-peer network. Mm. So that case does not provide a worthy precedent. Mm. Uh, They invoked Riley v. California, which is the government needing a warrant to search your cell phone. Again, that's completely different because of the quality and the nature of information that's uh, contained on on one's personal device and the fact that as opposed to peer-to-peer networks, you're not necessarily sharing anything by having something stored on your cell phone. You really could be attempting to to keep something private uh, if it's stored on your your own smartphone or or device. Mm -hmm. And they bring up United States v. Jones, uh, which was about tracking somebody with with a GPS tracker. I feel like that was a, a, a real long shot. That really has nothing to do with uh, the facts of this case. Okay. What the court said is basically none of those cases uh, offer any insight on peer-to-peer f- file sharing and that the precedent still holds that what you share you know, on a peer-to-peer network is, is public. Uh, you do not have a reasonable expectation of privacy and information. The government does not need a warrant to search it, and you could be subject uh, to arrest and prosecution. Uh, so I thought it was a, a really interesting case, uh, a really interesting investigative tool that law enforcement is using here, and reinforces the idea that, you know, what you do on these peer-to-peer networks almost by definition is public because you are sharing something Hmm. and passing files around, and therefore you forfeited your reasonable expectation of privacy. That is interesting. I mean, I I, I wonder, uh, I I would assume that the folks who are out there trying to share, you know, this horrible stuff with each other um, are trying to lay low with it, right? Like I, I would, I mean, it wouldn't, wouldn't you imagine that it's some sort of insular group that they would somehow try to establish their own bubble with each other? Yes. And is, is that possibly a defense by saying it's, we weren't putting this out for everyone to see. We were making an effort to keep this to our own s- small group of horrible people, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't think that would be a valid defense. I think what courts have said is you could be trying to 
in a certain sense, conceal the information that you're sharing, but you are still sharing it online. Um, It is, you know, even if you're sharing it with a a subset of people, it's still public. You're still using some sort of peer-to-peer network. Right, right. Uh, And so that doesn't provide you a defense that uh, you actually had a reasonable expectation of privacy in that information. Interesting. I think it's the nature of sharing that file, passing it to somebody else, putting it in the ether right. uh, that forfeits that reasonable expectation of privacy as opposed to a file stored on, on your own device that you haven't shared on a peer-to-peer network where the law is a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Or, um, you know, some of these other cases he talked about where, yes, maybe something's being shared publicly, but the quality and quantity of that information is so private and personal and revealing that that merits Fourth Amendment protection. Uh, what the court is saying here is, when none of those circumstances are present, there is no Fourth Amendment protection, and that's the case with peer-to-peer file-sharing networks. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Well, uh, we'll have a link to that in the show notes. Uh, my story this week uh, comes from uh, CNN. This is on their uh, politics page. Uh, it's written by Brian Fung and Geneva Sands, and it's titled, FBI Tells Congress Ransomware Payments Shouldn't Be Banned. Uh, This is pretty interesting uh, to me. Um, Recently, uh, Brian Vordren, who is the assistant director of the FBI's cyber division, uh, he spoke to Congress uh, before a a Senate Judiciary Committee hearing about ransomware. And he made the case that we should not, uh, as a matter of policy, ban ransomware payments. Um, now, you know, as, as we know, the, uh, we have the ability to prohibit selling things to different nations, you know, doing business with, uh, like, you know, you're not allowed to do business with North Korea. Yep. Right. And, and what's also, um, I think interesting sort of as in the history of this is that the FBI was out early on, uh, taking the position that you should not pay the ransom as a best practice, right? right? Because uh, paying the ransom uh, does all sorts of bad things. It, it uh, well, You're giving money to bad guys. You're encouraging that ecosystem and, and so on and so forth. Um, the, the case that uh, Brian Vordren makes, he, he made in, in his uh, testimony was he said, uh, if we ban ransom payments now, you're putting U.S. companies in a position to face yet another extortion which is being blackmailed for paying the ransom and not sharing that with authorities. I find that interesting. (laughs) I I thought that was a really interesting argument as well. Yeah. What do you make of that? It's not something I, I, on first blush, necessarily agree with. Mm -hmm. Um, So I, I think there's a distinction we need to make here. There's the best practice of, you know, the FBI and other law enforcement agencies have been telling us for a long time don't pay the ransom. It will simply encourage the MFers. Right. Uh, and, th- you know, I think that message is consistent with what the FBI is saying now. The separate question that they're bringing up, at, at, that they brought up at this committee hearing, is the prospect of Congress passing a law banning companies from paying ransoms. Mm-hmm. Um, and, or, you know, whether it's an explicit ban or fining a company with a civil or criminal fine. Uh, criminal penalty for paying the ransom. That's a different question entirely, and it can create, according to Mr. Uh, Vordren, a perverse incentive, which is that you would get blackmailed um, for uh, paying the ransom and and not sharing that with authorities. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the rationale there is, all right, we've been a victim of a ransomware attack. Federal law prohibits us from paying a ransom. Uh, but we really want our data back. <laughs> right. We want our data back very quickly. Uh, we need to run our business. So I'm going to pay you in cryptocurrency under the table, mm-hmm. and uh, we're going to never talk about this again. What uh, Mr. Vordren is saying is now the cyber criminals lord a lot of power over you because not only have they uh, extorted a ransom uh, from you, but they've also – now know that you've broken federal law by by paying that ransom, and that could lead them to try to induce you to pay additional payments. Right. It's it's a decent argument. Um, it sort of rubs me the wrong way because, and I don't know exactly how to put this. It it, it kind of is going too far into the incentive structures here. You know, I do think Congress could pass a, a general principle against, uh, you know, or. or 
explicitly penalizing companies or organizations from paying a ransom. Uh, and, you know, that might have some downstream effects, but not passing such a law also has downstream effects. Mm-hmm. So I just I, I just feel like it's a bit of a stretch to make that argument. Maybe that's just my opinion. I mean, is it, you know, I, I think about, um, for example, uh, I know of a, a, a community that um, – Uh, has a bunch of swimming pools, right? And uh, at the end of the swimming season, you're not allowed to just empty your swimming pools out into the local stream. Right. right? You get get fined for that. Right. It's a violation. Well, I know of a community that simply does it and chooses to pay the fine, right? Because it's— It's It's cheaper to do that. It's cheaper to do that. Mm -hmm. It's easier. It is—and so— they're willing to do that. So I guess what I'm thinking of is in a case like this, if if there were a fine for paying the ransom, uh, some organizations would choose to pay the ransom and pay the fine right. as a cost of getting their, their uh, data back. Is that a middle ground? It could be, and that would also cut against the argument that was made at this hearing, because at that point, then a company might not be ashamed or might not be able to be extorted um, into paying additional ransom with the threat that, oh, we're going to, you know, make it public that you that you paid the ransom, which is a violation of federal law. That company might just say, yeah, we paid the ransom. Yep. Yes, it's a violation of federal law or federal regulations, Mm -hmm. uh, but we're willing to pay the fine because we were that desperate to get our data back. Right, right. You know, that might happen with more frequency, in which case Congress might go a step further, either make the um, penalties prohibitively expensive or start actually prosecuting people seriously, you know, uh, putting CEOs behind bars, that sort of thing, which I just think is is a step that Congress would not be willing to take in the near future. No, I, I can also imagine that you could end up with uh, the haves and the have-nots, where uh, uh, an organization that has unlimited resources would it wouldn't hurt them at all to pay the fine. And we see this all the time, or big big companies get hit with fines that are, you know, big numbers, but relative to their Revenue, right? Exactly. Meaningless, right? <laughs> right. So, whereas a small company, a mom and pop, something like that, it could discourage them from. It could. It could be prohibitive for them to pay the ransom and the fine, and put them out of business. Yeah, and they're the ones who would suffer most from a ransomware attack in the first place. Yeah. Um, and so they're the ones that hopefully the law would be designed to protect. You know, ultimately the goal here is to discourage ransomware attacks. Yeah. Um, so if we're being unduly punitive to organizations who have suffered, maybe through some fault of their own, but but maybe, you know, maybe not. Maybe they just didn't have the resources to protect, you know, to to raise up proper cyber defenses. You know, we don't want to be in a position where we're being overly punitive to those people because that kind of defeats the purpose right. of passing a law in the first place, which is to protect these companies. You know, I think the middle ground is what the DOJ uh, has recently suggested. Uh, That mirrors federal legislation that's been proposed by a bipartisan cohort of United States senators, where there is a reporting requirement on federal agencies, contractors, critical infrastructure operators, where you at least have to tell the government that uh, your data has been breached. I think that's a a reasonable first step. Uh, It is silent on the issue of whether to pay the ransom. But I think starting with a reporting requirement, you know, giving the government details so that the government can start to track patterns, um, you know, to start to try and figure out who some of these bad uh, cyber criminals are, and you know, the government can can pool resources to try and rectify the problem. I think that could be the proper middle ground here, without addressing this landmine of whether to punish organizations for paying the ransom. Hmm. All right. Well, we will have a link to that article in the show notes as well. Uh, And of course, we would like to hear from you. If you have uh, something you'd like us to discuss here on our show or you have a question for us, you can write us. It's caveat at thecyberwire.com. Now, a word from our sponsor, the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, currently seeking qualified applicants for its innovative Master of Science in Security Informatics degree program. 
study alongside world-class interdisciplinary experts, and gain unparalleled educational, research, and professional experience in information security and assurance. Interested U.S. citizens should consider the National Science Foundation's CyberCorps Scholarship for Service program, which covers tuition and a $6,000 annual professional development allowance, as well as providing a $37,000 additional annual stipend. Apply for the scholarship and the fall semester by March 1st. Learn more at cs.jhu.edu slash mssi. Ben, I recently uh, had the pleasure of speaking with David Derajotis. He is from the firm Burns and Wilcox. And uh, actually, David caught my attention over on Twitter. Uh, so I'm, I'm pulling a Ben Yellen here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, You're turning into me, getting all of your good sources from there you Twitter. Go. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I don't know if that's something I should brag about or not. But no. uh, but David caught my eye with uh, some um, some information that he was sharing about some fraud protection that is provided by the Electronic Fund Transfer Act. And it was some stuff that I was unaware of. So I thought it was uh, worth sharing with our audience here. We reached out and he agreed to come on the show. So here's my conversation with David Derjotis. We oversee placing complex risks for our clients all over North America. So it's assisting with areas of professional liability, maybe for a law firm or for an accounting firm, or it could be medical uh, malpractice coverage for a physician, a doctor, or it could be securing coverage for a data breach, cyber and privacy liability. That's been one of the biggest areas of growth and one of the greatest areas of focus, probably over the last 12 months or so, just with everything going on. So it's all specialty insurance, advising on coverage, making sure that the right terms and conditions are in place, and working with clients to make sure that their risk management needs are met. Well, what led to our conversation today is I actually saw a series of posts that you put out on Twitter uh, where you were calling attention to uh, an issue one of your clients was having with a credit union. Can you walk us through what exactly was going on there? Yeah, th- this law is probably one of the most important consumer protection laws in place, but unfortunately, most consumers do not know that it exists. And really, it's looking like some financial t- institutions don't know that it exists either. You know, I was contacted by the local uh, news to speak on protections around online transfers, uh, mobile banking, what we can do to, to secure our accounts and protect our funds. Because what happened, a, a local resident in Detroit was scammed. She was taken advantage of. And she thought that somebody from the bank had reached out to her. But of course, it wasn't somebody from the bank. They told her that her funds were uh, being frozen. Somebody was trying to access her account in Texas. And she was rightfully concerned. And when I spoke with her, she said that a level of trust was built because she saw on the caller ID that it was coming up as her credit union. And, you know, I explained hmm. to her that spoofing is a very easy thing to accomplish and you can make it look like it's coming from anywhere that you want the call to appear to be coming from. So she doesn't recall giving any type of account access over the phone, but somehow the criminals were able to get into her account and they were able to transfer $4,000 in four separate $1,000 transactions through Mm. the Zelle software that was tied into her uh, banking, into her account. So she called the, the, the credit union the next day and they told her, we never called you. Don't ever give out any type of information. But they also told her, unfortunately, there was nothing that they could do. And that's just not the hmm. case. Well, OK, so explain to us, because I, I think a, a lot of people at that point would would sort of chalk this up to being out of luck that, oh, you know, I, I got scammed and I guess I've learned a hard lesson here. But what protections are in place? Yeah, there, there's something called the Electronic Fund Transfer Act. And this is a very key consumer protection piece of law that has to do with really operating and living in a digital world, a- operating and accessing your bank account online through mobile apps, uh, the use of an ATM. This law was passed and signed uh, back in 1978, believe it or not, before way before mm. we've gotten to the digital you know, adoption that we have today. And, and back then, it really had to do more with ATMs and, and the use of automated teller machines in general. But what, what this consumer protection law does is it will actually 
provide a recourse for a consumer if somebody accesses their bank account, if they make some type of unauthorized transfer. And that's exactly what happened in this case. And it really appears that the credit union doesn't even know that this law exists because they don't appear to be working with her to resolve her issue and to put the funds back into her account. So help me understand here. I mean, because I think something that we uh, like a common um, advice that I've heard from folks is that if you're charging things online, you should use a credit card instead of a debit card because credit card has better protections than a debit card. But uh, the flip side of that is I've always wondered if I, if I'm sitting here minding my business, not, you know, not doing anything, someone manages to break into my bank and uh, virtually electronically and, and steal some of my funds. Isn't that on the bank for allowing that to happen the same way as if someone walked into the bank and, and, you know, emptied out the vault? Absolutely. It is on the bank 100 percent. And there are a variety of protections in place when consumers use credit cards. This law doesn't apply to the use of credit cards. It, It has specifically to do with ACHs. It has to do with the use of debit cards, even gift cards. They made some amendments to it and it applies to to the use of those. So if anybody were to conduct an unauthorized transaction, if it doesn't matter if the consumer unknowingly gave up account access, if you gave your email address, your password, your phone number, anything that it takes to get into your account, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which actually oversees this law and, and the rulemaking for it, they came out with a, a bunch of FAQs surrounding fraud and abuse social engineering, which was very helpful. I think it provides a lot of great information. If a consumer uh, unknowingly gives it away because they think they're corresponding with somebody from the bank, the, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau states that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if the consumer gave them keys to the kingdom, access to the account. The financial institution is still going to be responsible for that unauthorized transaction, and they need to reimburse the consumer for those lost funds. So while there are a great deal of protections around using credit cards, there's also another set of protections uh, that have to do specifically with debit cards, the use of a checking account and savings account for consumers. And and that's where this one applies right in the bullseye. You also pointed out in this series of tweets that um, this person may be entitled to statutory damages in addition. That's the interesting part about this law is that it is preemptive. And that's where we get into a lot of problems with passing a national privacy law. You know, the states, some have uh, more comprehensive laws and rules around consumer protections. And with putting a, a national privacy law in place, the fight uh, is always, is this going to be preemptive? Is this going to override any of our state data breach notification laws or state consumer protections that are put in place? This law actually preempts any type of weaker state protections that are in place. And within that that law, within the the rules, there are up to $1,000 of statutory damages that can be awarded for the consumer along with attorney's fees and, of course, any actual damages that they've sustained in the loss. So for someone who has sustained a loss in this way, there's been unauthorized transfer out of their bank account or something like that, what, what what do you recommend in terms of pursuing this, of, of make, if they're having trouble with the bank, of, of uh, letting them know that this is out there? Yeah. First and foremost, you have to contact the bank because they do have guidelines around notice and letting the financial institution uh, know that something has happened. So typically the way the wording is laid out, you have two days after you become aware of uh, the unauthorized transaction. So you can let the bank know either by making a call, uh, communicating it to them verbally or through uh, some type of written communication, or up to 60 days after you receive some type of statement in the mail or online. So th- they give a bit of a window there. And, and if you can get a hold of the bank within that time frame, two days after you find out or within 60 days of viewing it on the statement, your liability is dramatically reduced, typically up to $50 you'll be responsible for. In some cases, 500. In this particular hmm. case, for Constance, who was involved in it, you know, we're talking about $4,000. But again, if you're not getting any type of reaction out of the credit union, the finance, financial institution that you've contacted, you do have a recourse through the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau directly. And I advise filing a complaint with them, and they can look into the matter on your behalf to, to try to get that money back for you. 
I realize this is a little bit like asking a, a, a barber if I need a haircut, but uh, perhaps reaching out to a, a lawyer who could take your case as well? Absolutely. There are a number of uh, attorneys that specialize in consumer protection laws, and I know that uh, there would be an attorney out there without question that would be willing to get their hands on this. Because again, the, the law is in favor of the consumer and the burden is on the financial institution to show that it was not, in fact, an unauthorized transaction. So whether you do it yourself, you have the resources working through the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, pushing forward ahead with the credit union or institution, or uh, in some cases, getting a hold of a lawyer that can represent you. And there are uh, rules in here that that they could uh, allow for the payment of the attorney fees, which would, uh, you know, I guess take away some of the fear that someone might have of engaging an attorney that they'll end up with uh, with a lot of money out of pocket. No, that's exactly right. And that's why the law provides that type of recourse for consumers, not only getting your money back, but because you had to go through the trouble, the time, the energy, and the, the expense of hiring attorney, you, know, you will get that reimbursed and covered you know, the way the law reads. And, and on top of that, throw another $1,000 for statutory damages. If there are protections that are needed for consumers. It's interesting to me that that there isn't broader awareness that this exists. You know, as, as we sort of said at the outset, I was under the uh, – this is news to me that I guess that this protection exists to the degree that which it does. Yeah, you know, that, it's very interesting because the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau just came out in June. I mean, we're talking just a few months ago, a couple months ago. They came out with some clarifying statements and Q&A around this exact scenario that we're discussing. So I think there were some misinterpretations in the way that the law was drafted and the way that the the wording applied, but they were very clear in how they addressed fraud, how they addressed social engineering. There are There is recourse for a consumer. The burden is on the financial institution. And there's just so much confusion around it because looking back at this case in particular, Dave, there's been some uh, fighting between the financial institution, or I don't want to say fighting, maybe arguing or, or pointing fingers back and forth. The financial right. institution was trying to recoup money from Zell, and Zell was saying, no, this isn't our responsibility. This is your responsibility to reimburse uh, your customer on this. So there does still seem to be a lot of confusion. In this case, clearly the credit union isn't aware of, of the rules, the law, and what type of protections are in place, or they clearly would have reimbursed her by now. That's why it's, it's so important. You have to be armed with this knowledge. You need it to have it in your back pocket if you find that the financial institution is not working on your behalf and working to restore your funds. All right, Ben, what do you think? First thing I'll say is, who knows? If you engage with us on Twitter, you could end up on our show. So <laughs> always respond to our tweets uh, when when we're we're interested in. in we're what looking you have to at say. you, Orin Kerr. <sighs> I've, I've been trying. The invitation is open anytime, any day. That's right. I will That's right. I will interview you twenty four seven in the <laughs> middle of the night if I have to. Okay. Uh, it was really interesting. It was a really interesting story to me. I mean, it's kind of surprising that credit unions would not be fully versed in uh, a law that requires them to protect the uh, financial transactions of their own consumers. Mm -hmm. I understand it because credit unions don't have the same type of legal department resources that the big banks have. It was still sort of surprising to hear. And it seems like protection, uh, according to this law that he was referencing, is, is pretty robust if, um, you know, somebody fraudulently convinces you to give them information that might give them access to your uh, to your money, to your bank account. Right. right. Um, so I, I was sort of surprised listening to it, particularly the aspect of the credit unions themselves not being aware of this law that they're obligated to follow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was interesting. That, that fascinated me too as well. The, this, this idea that um, the protections are far more robust than I think I had assumed that they would be uh, because I think a lot of times it's it's easy to be cynical and assume that things are sort of stacked up against the consumer. Which they are in many contexts. Right, yeah. absolutely. So to hear that there is this robust protection for folks out there, uh, I think it's a good thing. And I, I think it's uh, something that uh, we should help spread the word about if you find yourself – uh, in a situation where you've been hit by something like this, you know, do, do a little bit of homework, 
uh, reach out to someone with expertise, someone someone like David, uh, who can help you navigate that sort of thing and, and just make sure that you aren't leaving anything on the table. Yeah, and I think it was particularly poignant because the example that he brought was somebody who was clearly exploited. You know, it was someone who, you know, fell for a scam. You know, this person, in retrospect, it, you know, maybe one of us would have uh, caught on when, when somebody was calling us asking for this information, but many of us would not have caught on. Right. So they are exploiting somebody, um, and the law is designed to protect people who have been exploited in that manner. And, you know, we should we should be taking advantage of those consumer protections. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, again, our thanks to David Derajotis from Burns & Wilcox for joining us. We do appreciate him taking the time. That is our show. We want to thank all of you for listening. The Caveat Podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our senior producer is Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Ben Yellen. Thanks for listening.